It's all Jeb. It's all Jeb. How long is it for each topic? About, about 30 minutes, minutes Including right? discussion, we try to keep it, but it's a lot of, about 30 minutes is what we're aiming for. Okay. That being said, I think we do typically go over a little bit, but we do want to kind of keep it around that time. So that's not too long, you know? Mm -hmm. So is there a presentation first and then we talk? Well, the way I wanted to do it with you guys, Samir, was to sort of have every couple of slides ask for your input. So instead of having a whole presentation rather involved you involved you right away uh, on all the decision process, as you'll see, there's kind of like a timeline. And so yep. at each point, I'll be asking for your comments and feel free to jump in. Okay. And, and I've got a few kind of learning points at the end of that, probably four or five major learning points in this case. Okay. Okay. And Thomas, how would you like us to participate? Are you going to um, do the whole case and then ask us to chime in? So, first of all, I, I'd love um, if you if you feel like you'd like to make a comment at any point, please interrupt. Um, but there are two or three times where I'll specifically ask uh, for the panelists' comments, and a couple of those as well. There'll be an associated um, poll question for the audience that Jeff has, so they'll be able to interact while we're having the discussion as well. And, and Jeb, I read that you on purpose want me to disagree with Susan. So Susan, I'm probably going to agree with you. I come in peace. <laughs> on purpose, I might disagree just to make it a little spicy. As much I disagreement as possible like... is always a good thing. I don't like conflicts. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna open the room up, guys. So we have people attending. So uh, they're gonna be walking in as we speak. So um, welcome everybody. We're just getting started. As you know, we take a few minutes to uh, get going. Let everybody in the room. It's I can uh, and Jeb here join with our faculty. We'll be introducing shortly. Um, and uh, those of you that are that are joining here on Zoom and uh, and on YouTube as well, feel free to uh, use the chat box. Tell us where you tell us where you're calling in from or where you're zooming in from. It's always nice to hear uh, people from around the world uh, that uh, that that we see uh, on these uh, webinars now. So I thought I would just ask mm -hmm. um, our group here while we're getting going. Just what's happening has been pretty well. Almost, almost. Well, not quite. Maybe seven weeks since we've been shut down here in in Canada for the most part, in Toronto at least. Um, and I'm just curious about anybody, some of you folks here, anybody kind of getting back into the swing of some not normal, but some regular activity that isn't just urgent or emergency. Anybody uh, had anyone gone back yet to do anything like that yet? Not us. Yeah, Boston, we're still, we're still, uh, uh, Whoa. Oh, Samir, go ahead. Samir, I think Samir was saying something. Samir, go yeah. ahead. I was just saying that in Boston, we're still uh, shut down. We are seeing emergencies. I uh, I just did an emergency cataract this morning for a retina surgeon who needed to do something. and But that's probably the only case I did in the last uh, six weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, here in Manitoba, they're opening up. They're opening up even things like patios for restaurants, and uh, they're opening up a few more things. Here in the office, we're doing very, very staged uh, approach, but uh, we started doing YAGs this week and some new patients as well. We have all the safety measures and uh, germ shields, breath shields, masks for everyone, every patient that comes in as well. And uh, that is allowing us to, to start going that way. Probably in the next two weeks, we'll start with elective surgery, we hope. We're okay. all hospital-based here. So the hospital has a directive. We were supposed to start maybe reassessing on May 12th, but I think it got moved out now to May 19th. So it's urgent emergent care. We do have some access to the R, but it's only for emergency cases. Okay. How about you, Susan? Yeah, same here. And in the my main hospital where I work with, we had a severe like rush of cases of COVID. So the hospital, the whole hospital became a hot zone. So even for my severe glaucomas, the elderly ones, I didn't want to even bring them to the hospital. I was seeing them at another place. So we're really still on urgent, semi-urgent cases. And we're probably going to have a lag behind everybody else at my hospital. Hmm. All this is an outbreak, and then all of a sudden things change, don't they, for a while? Yeah. What about you, Joanna? What's, uh, what's your situation like? So our situation uh, is just emergencies also, but we're opening up our ORs. Uh, this week, actually, there's a few ORs going on, and they're splitting them between surgeons just for semi-urgent cases. So um, besides retinal attachments, some people are doing glaucomas that are more advanced, uh, some, you know, what we have to like pass it through a sort of a committee or somebody has to okay the fact that it's semi-urgent. So for cornea, it means 
chronic edema seems to be something that uh, would be okay because of the long-term fibrosis that can settle, settle in. But um, other than that, I've done like one patch graft and two uh, emergent transplants for like uh, bad ulcers. And that's it, I haven't done any surgery. And we're just ramping up in our clinics too, but ramping up in our clinics means uh, 20 patients instead of eight. It's, it's like we've taken out all the chairs in the waiting room. It's really, um... oh, hello. I've been there again <laughs> early this time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we're seeing different I... parts. So you have, you have to start. I have to wait. Have to wait. Um, great. Okay, we'll get over with now. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I talked to some colleagues in the US and, and apparently some people are doing LASIK already. So I, I was quite... I was quite wow. surprised, I guess, that that's happening in some parts of the country. Uh, Samir, I don't know if, I'm sure not in Boston, but, but down south a bit from you and, uh, and cataract as well. So, I mean, there's so many different, I guess, you know, it's also different in each area, I presume, obviously, in terms of what the, um, what the risk is and what the incidence is. So, all yeah. right. Well, yeah, Samir, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we, were, we just had a discussion, like, right before this meeting with my team, and we thought, uh, right before we, we're gonna maybe start with like three days of LASIK before we start just get the backlog of cases out of the way just so we have the whole clinic to ourselves and we don't have to worry about you know we have more space to do them and this way we catch up and then we go back to clinic uh, a few days later um, mm -hmm. usually we do LASIK once a week but we're gonna do like three days in a row and then clear the backlog and you think for LASIK that uh, I mean it's, it's certainly the aerosol aerosolizing generating questions that come around with FACO, vitrectomy, LASIK. Right. Um, I'm sure you've heard many different opinions. Uh, do you guys have an idea what you're going to do for that? We're going to wear N95 masks for in the laser in the laser room. Yeah. Um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, Jeb, I think we should get started. We've got a nice group of uh, folks here um, on, on Zoom and on, uh, on YouTube. So I'll let you take over, Jeb. Sounds good. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. A uh, brief reminder, our website is www.prismainstitute.com uh, slash webinars. For any questions, comments, please send them to ike.webinars at prismai.ca. A uh, bit of an announcement here, but our rounds are officially accredited now. So you'll be able to, um, to uh, claim 2.0 hours in total. Uh, it is important that you're going to register through Zoom because that is the way that you'll be getting your certificates of attendance. Uh, a day after the webinar, you're going to get an email. There's going to be a link there for a survey so that you can get back feedback. Anything that you think could be improved, you can mention there. And also, that's where you're going to fill out a Google form, and it'll automatically generate a certificate of attendance for you. So that's very important that you look at that. But uh, there we go. So a uh, brief review, we're looking for either lectures, um, presentations, or articles that you wish to review. If you want to express your interest, please send uh, your your um, emails to the email address that I mentioned earlier. Our website is up and running, so you can access previously recorded webinars, and you can also register for future ones there. So coming up this, uh, this Saturday, we have a special event. It's Surgical Feud. We're going to have uh, two teams of international surgeons. They're going to go head to head, one after the other, uh, discussing controversial topics in ophthalmology. And you, as the audience, you'll be able to participate in that you'll actually be able to vote who's the winner. So you're going to want to be there. This is going to be fun and educational. Uh, that is May 9th at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. So our first speaker today is Dr. Thomas Burke. He's currently a fourth year ophthalmology resident at McGill University in Montreal. He did his medical training at the University of Toronto. On his panel, we have Dr. Cindy Hutnick, who's a professor in ophthalmology and pathology at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry in London, Ontario. She serves in the executive of the CGS. She did her glaucoma fellowship at the University of Wisconsin, and she did her residency at the University of Western Ontario. Next, we have Dr. Susan Wakil. She's a glaucoma surgeon at Montreal Sacré Cœur Hospital. She's a, she did her glaucoma fellowship at Duke University in North Carolina, and she did her residency at McGill University in Montreal. The second speaker today is Dr. Guillermo Rocha. He's the medical director of TLC Laser Eye Center, LMD in Winnipeg. He's the medical director of the Ocular Microsurgery and Laser Center. He's also medical staff in the Brandon Regional uh, Minnedosa and Misericordia Health Centers. He's also a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Manitoba. On his panel, we have Dr. Samir Melki. He's an associate professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. He's the founder and director of the Boston Eye Group. He did a cornea and refractive surgery fellowship at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, and he did his residency at Georgetown University. 
Next, we have Dr. Joanna Karamis, who, interestingly enough, this is a picture of her before COVID. She's been uh, promoting uh, patient distancing since even uh, a few years back, back when I was a resident with her. Uh, she's an assistant professor at McGill University. She's the chief of the cornea department at the University of Montreal. Uh, she did a cornea and anterior segment fellowship at Tufts University, and she did her residency at McGill University. So I'm going to give it back to Ike while uh, Thomas loads up his slides. Well, thanks, Jeb, and thanks, Jeb, for all your hard work in getting everyone together. Uh, these rounds started off really just with our own uh, group here at PRISM, and uh, and then has grown into a community, and uh, in, within our region, within our country, and then beyond that. So I just was reading uh, the chat line here, where we see a lot of people who have written in, and uh, we've got people from all over uh, the world here, from South America, from Europe, I see here, uh, from the U.S., um, so from Middle East. It's great to see everybody here from Africa, Uganda. We got the Uganda, Uganda representative, all of us coming out. So thank you, Ahmed, for being here as well. From Jordan, all over the place. So thank you for uh, for doing that. Um, our first speaker is, uh, is Thomas Burke. Thomas Burke, I first met as a medical student actually uh, back some time ago. Now is is a resident uh, at the McGill in Montreal, and uh, I think he is uh, certainly caught the glaucoma bug, I believe, and interested in glaucoma. I hope. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your presentation, Thomas. As usual, we, we expect to have some interruptions from the panelists and from me. Uh, the uh, folks online may ask questions, so we may uh, pass those questions on to you while you're speaking, and, uh, and we look forward to, and to, your, to, your, to your discussion here. And then after that, of course, we'll have uh, Guillermo uh, Rocha to present as well. So thank you, Thomas. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. And uh, just going to apologize here for um, not having my webcam active. It's a bit on the fritz. So uh, to avoid it flashing in everybody's faces, I'll, uh, I'll just share my screen here. And um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Ahmed and, and uh, Jeb for uh, having me join you today. Um, I can say that as a learner during this uh, difficult time, this uh, webinar series has really become a highlight of, uh, of my week. And I'm really very humbled to be in front of such a panel and such an audience and, and participating. Um, I'd also just like to express a note of thanks to uh, my supervisor, Dr. Hadi Saheb. He's unable to be with us uh, today on the Zoom call as he's seeing some uh, urgent cases in the clinic, but uh, his fingerprints are all over this presentation as well. Um, so no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest uh, to share here. And we'll jump into the learning objectives. I really hope at the end of this lecture, um, we'll be able to have developed a clinical framework and approach to bilateral acute angle closure glaucoma through an illustrative case. We'll be able to understand the mechanisms, strengths, and also the limitations of common hyperosmotics um, that we, off we often use in the emergent setting. And also to reinforce the value and critical importance of what it means to really be a, a full body doctor in terms of past medical history and current medication history, specifically as it pertains to the glaucoma patient. So we'll jump into the case here. And um, this is a patient that I was fortunate to see while I was on call. A 72 year old Caucasian gentleman came in from his optom for bilateral acute angle closure. And um, on the HPI, he was complaining of some redness, just mild decreased visual acuity for about a week in the right and much more acute and um, impressive symptoms on the left. No history of trauma, uh, no allergies or family history to share. His past medical history was only uh, significant for essential primary hypertension. And he shared with us that he was on Coversil, which is the ACE inhibitor perindopril. And as far as his past ocular history, he was amblyopic in the right eye, mildly, not densely from strabismus as a child. He was a very significant hyperope, as you can see. And I've put in parentheses here in italics, some biometric uh, information that I must admit I did, I, I did not have at the time when I first saw the patient, but in the subsequent months, the patient did undergo cataract surgery, as we'll see. And I think it's important for us when we're discussing the case to have a sense of what the eye looked like um, in order to, uh, to better understand what we're dealing with here. And he was not on any drops. Um, so this is a representative photo uh, of his right eye. And um, as you can see there on the caption, it was the same on the left, but uh, the cornea was more edematous. And uh, basically what we see here is diffuse corneal edema in the stroma and in the epithelium. We can see the granularity of the, um, of the uh, epithelial uh, slit lamp light reflex there. And we can also appreciate that the AC is quite shallow peripherally and a bit deeper centrally. And we just summarized the rest of the slit lamp exam uh, over here. We can see once again, the corneal edema more diffuse on the left than the right. A bit of an AC reaction on the right. The left, to be honest, I wasn't able to properly assess because of the corneal edema and fixment dilated pupils and two plus NSOU. 
The rest of the exam, we see here uh, moderate loss of visual acuity on the right and significant on the left. Um, fixed mid-dilated pupils, as mentioned, and elevated IOPs, the slit lamp exam there once again, and going yo was closed 360 degrees on both sides. No PAS was visible at the time, but I must admit the corneas were edematous, as mentioned, and um, there was definitely at least an element of Bombay occurring because uh, we saw the iris was bowing anteriorly with significant lens rise. Um, undilated fundus exam, we can see hyperemic cup to disc ratio of 0.1 on the right with no view on the left. So emergent treatment was initiated here for this um, rather scary, I must admit, as a, I must admit as a resident, a rather scary case uh, to see a bilateral acute attack. We started with um, travaprost timolol fixed combination along with brinzolamide bromonidine both eyes with diamox times one uh, uh, in the acute uh, setting there. Um, that really didn't touch him very much at 30 minutes and another round of drops was given. And then at 60 minutes, there still wasn't enough of an effect that we were happy with. So we gave another round of drops. We gave another 250 of, uh, of Diamox or Cetazolamide here. And then we sent the patient back to the emergency room from the eye clinic for an infusion of 20% mannitol uh, with cardiac monitoring in place. 120 minutes after his initial presentation, so after the mannitol infusion was run for an hour there, um, the IOP was better controlled. The corneal edema had improved. It was felt that we could safely uh, accomplish an LPI in both eyes, and he came back to the eye clinic. Thomas, can you just hold on for a second? Just hold on for a second. Yeah, sure. I wonder if we can just pause here, maybe get some input from the panel here. So, any, I mean, I know there's a whole question about the diagnosis, but let's just talk about this case here, just in terms of the pressure and the, and the, and the treatment here. So, you've uh, started medical therapy, and then now the plan is for an LPI. So, I'm just curious, Cindy and Susan, uh, and again, this is all about different opinions or maybe uh, confirming your plan, but your thoughts about the plan here, the plan is to go to do an LPI next. What are your thoughts? Well, I think um, the way this was handled makes a lot of sense. When I, first of all, when I see bilateral acute angle closure glaucoma, it does sort of get me thinking because it's not nearly as common as it is unilateral. You know, if you look at all of the risk factors, so right off the bat, I'm a little bit suspicious. Is this pupillary block or is this um, not a pupillary block mechanism? So Thomas, to be clear, was he pseudophagic in both eyes? Uh, no, he had uh, two plus NS on both eyes. Okay, so he was phagic. So it's looking like a pupillary block mechanism. And in terms of his systemic medications, he was only on an ACE inhibitor. Is that correct? Uh, well, I will say that that's what he told us. <laughs> I see. <laughs> because the dangers, and I'll turn it over to Susan, but at the get-go, it's really important to decide, is this a pupillary block or a non-pupillary block? Because if it is a ciliocoroidal effusion, going down the pathway of using certain medications, um, even like um, a sulfonamide, like cetazolamide, could actually make it worse, or a PI may not be indicated. So um, it, it looks like it's a pupillary block, which looks like you've done the standard thing, but you know, you always have at the back of your mind, if it's not, and it's a um, ciliocoidal effusion with maybe some um, choroidal detachment, it's, it's, it's a different beast and it's handled differently. So um, I'll leave it at that and ask Susan for, for her thoughts. Yeah, I very much agree, especially like you just said, when they're bilateral, immediately makes you think, is there something more systemic or is there, let's say, VKH or inflammatory component to this causing a, an anterior rotation of the iris lens diaphragm and so forth? And like you said, sulfa, uh, history of sulfa or even like uh, anticholinergic um, and so forth. So you may want to give them atropine in cases like that rather than jumping to LPI to relieve the pupil block component. Mind you, he does have, um, if we look at the first slide where you presented his biometrics, he does have factors putting him at risk of a pupil block mechanism. He has like, if we look at the anterior chamber and so forth, the anterior chamber depth and the lens thickness, which is normal, he seems like more of a relative anterior microphthalmus um, type of uh, patient. So he's at risk of that, but and the other option is before jumping to LPI in cases like that where you're debating, um, sometimes doing a B scan. I don't know if that was available at that time, but to see if there's any um, thickening or anything uh, in the back pushing uh, things forward. Yes, yeah, so be... I'm actually really happy, um, uh, Dr. Wakil, that you brought up that point. Uh, definitely a B scan would have been very helpful here to, uh, again, tease out some of the points that both yourself and Dr. Hutnick um, 
brought up. Unfortunately, at the time, the B scan at the hospital where I was on call was out for repairs. So um, we had to make do uh, without any imaging support. Um, and there was no anterior segment uh, OCT uh, or UBM uh, available at that site either. Um, and so you know, my that, comment to that, Thomas, is you know, a lot of times these patients come in at night. So um, you go down this, you're doing the typical path, what looks like the typical pupillary block in a hyperop patient kind of way. Um, so the question is, do you do the LPI at night or do you wait until you can get not only a, a B scan, but maybe um, ultrasound biomicroscopy and even an anterior segment OCT? Because if you're able to do all that, then you can really decide which path you should go down. So to me, as a resident at night, you might be just doing this because you don't really have access to any imaging for that reason. Yeah, the only thing I'm going to add is that I, I probably am, am in the minority here and that I, I think it's rare you have to rush in and do a PI. I mean, I I very often will just say, listen, treat medically, wait, let the eye settle down and then plan the next step. Because often it's hard to get the PI in. The cornea is edematous, the pupil is dilated, the iris is pretty boggy and inflamed. Uh, and, and you don't know necessarily the full mechanism or whether there's sinicia present, which in that case, a PI may, not, may make it worse even. So I, I don't rush to do an LPI. I know the textbooks often will say that. Uh, I think that these patients can be delayed in their therapy uh, and wait and wait until they need something more. And if they're that bad that um, that a PI would be needed, I don't know if a PI would actually even necessarily resolve it. I'm glad the pressure's come down. So I think you have a bit of time. Uh, and that's what I would suggest. And I do like the imaging part, but I know you have more to talk about this case, but I just want to mention that it's not, it shouldn't be an automatic thing. I have to do a PI no matter what. I and think I, that um, that there are certain, certainly some time you can you can wait. And quickly, I'll say, I agree with you completely. I think they do better the next day when the ischemic attack has been broken and you've had them on steroid a little bit. I think they just do better if you can wait at least a day. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, often what I'll do is I'll, I'll just skip the PI. I'll just wait, wait for a few days and take them to the OR and do FACO. Um, <laughs> if, I, if, if their pressures are controlled and uh, even if they're not, you know, a PI doesn't necessarily resolve a lot of cases. So just something to think about for that. Uh, no, all, all really great points, um, and thank you very much for jumping in like that. Please continue to do that as, as we go along. It, it really enhances my learning, even, even as I'm giving this, uh, this talk. Um, um, sorry to interrupt you, Thomas. Yeah, I think yeah, somebody sure. on the Q&A, if I'm looking at the right chat box, was mentioning why not pilocarpine, if I understand the correctly the question. And I think to answer that and correct me, uh, Dr. Hutnick, um, you don't give in cases like that pilocarpine immediately, just in case it's a mechanism where there's an anterior rotation of the cellular body. So if you give them pilocarpine on the get-go, you may worsen that mechanism um, and so forth and not help them in cases like that. So that's why I tend to usually avoid pilocarpine in the, at the beginning of cases like that. Susan, I couldn't agree with you more and I'll be the first to admit I've actually changed what I do partly because we don't have any low dose pilocarpine around here, even, even with an acute pupillary block hyperopic short axial length. If you have higher concentrations of pilocarpine, you can actually inadvertently make it worse by shoving the lens iris diaphragm forward. And in fact, if it is a cilial choroidal diffusion, you're maybe better off with a cycloplegic. So um, I agree, it, it's, it's what's in the recipe. And when I was a resident, it was part of the, I used to think this was the easiest thing on call. Oh yeah, acute angle closure, pilocarpine, LPI, and it's done. But um, I think it can actually be um, a, a mismanagement now. Sorry, Tom. I'm, uh, uh, sorry, um, Dr. Hutnick, I don't know if you were finished there. Yep, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy these points are coming up really um, because we're gonna touch on pretty much uh, all of them. And I think it's really gonna enhance the discussion as we move forward. Um, so as a resident on call, if this uh, wasn't a, an exciting enough situation, uh, this happened then. Um, so as the patient arrived back to the clinic for his LPI bilaterally after his uh, mannitol infusion, he actually became unresponsive, apneic, and uh, I could not feel his pulses. And so I immediately called the code blue. The code team arrived, placed a cardiac monitor that showed that he was bradycardic and hypotensive. And they resuscitated him with one, a one liter uh, normal saline bolus uh, intravenously, as well as a half milligram of atropine IV. At that point in time, uh, after giving him a chance to catch his breath, the LPI was successfully performed bilaterally with the patient on a cardiac monitor with the code team present in our eye clinic, which um, the staff that was on call with me at the time, I should mention, uh, it was not Dr. Saheb. Uh, Dr. Saheb took over the, the care of this patient after the acute presentation. Um, and the, uh, the staff on call uh, was a cornea specialist actually at the time. 
Um, the staff on call said that it was the most exciting PI uh, experience he had had in his 25 year career. Um, uh, and certainly it was the most exciting that I had had in my, uh, in my residency. Um, post laser, his pressure was uh, 15 and 12, and uh, he was sent back to the emergency room for some overnight observation given the cardiac event here. So at this point in time, and I'm gonna have the panelists jump in here in just one moment, what we were operating on at the time, myself and the cornea specialist on call, was a working diagnosis of primary pupillary block angle closure bilaterally, felt to be acute in the left eye and potentially acute on chronic in the right eye, because if you recall, the right eye was not as severe a presentation and actually had been intermittently bothering him for about six days before the acute attack. The uh, reasons that we felt um, this fit uh, the diagnosis at the time, and again, to, to be fair to everyone, the axial length and the anterior chamber, we didn't know at the time, but he was a plus uh, 750 hyperope, two plus NS and 72 years old, all of which are significant risk factors as we know. And uh, once again, complicated by bradycardia and hypotension, secondary to a beta blockade from all the timolol that he received, as well as volume contraction from the significant diuresis that he experienced with the IV mannitol infusion. And once again, the LPI was performed following resuscitation. So we, we touched a bit about, uh, upon uh, some of the, the points I was hoping the panelists would, uh, would get at already, but perhaps if they have any further thoughts before we move on. I think you're highlighting something that I believe strongly in, you know, when we, in ophthalmology, we just don't treat an eyeball, we treat the patient and um, our medications are not benign. So you're clearly showing that this is the case. In fact, I'm a super big fan, my residents know of IV mannitol, and I'm very fortunate that our urgent care at the hospital will monitor the patient because they can actually get brainstem uncle herniation, but, um, you know, they can actually have such serious um, complications just from that. So you're highlighting that nothing that we're doing is really benign and we have to be considerate. But, you know, when you talk about management, there's conservative medical and surgical. So, you, you know, I think this definitely is something you have to start off with medical. But again, if the mechanism is, is an effusion at the back, one of the most conservative things you can do is wait. So, um, again, I think, I, I, so Susan agrees, I probably wouldn't have done anything different at this point, And I am a fan of mannitol, I guess question arise, do you think the systemic intravenous atropine was a good thing or a bad thing? So Susan, what do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think what, like you were saying, waiting off until we know the better, you know, the exact mechanism of all this uh, would help. And who knows also maybe performing uh, LPI as well wouldn't have helped his uh, cardiac uh, condition in terms of, you know, causing maybe some vasovagal response if uh, the LPI is uncomfortable and so forth. Often up these iris uh, in a acute angle closure, they're bunched up. And so it's not easy to, to go through uh, in a PI and could lead to a lot of discomfort to the patient. Um, now, exactly. It's true. If it's a atropine may have helped if uh, it's a more of a systemic or medication induced uh, um, cause. But like uh, I was mentioning earlier, if we look at the biometrics of his axial length being, you know, uh, okay, not too short, like less than uh, 20 is like an anophthalmic eye and a shallow AC depth. I think this guy, this patient had to begin with um, perhaps a, a history of a more of a chronic um, shallowing of his chamber. So a relative anterior microphthalmus picture putting him at risk of that. Now, did something happen to tip him over into an angle closure? That could have been also um, why it's more bilateral rather than unilateral in this case. Um, and other questions sometimes, has he been getting symptoms of intermittent and angle closure, um, such as, you know, more headaches and dim lights and so forth that may sometimes can help you know if there's like intermittent closures happening here and there. And I guess a question to, to anybody is, um, would you have waited, given the fact that you call the cold blue, would there have been any merit now to just hold off and um, just uh, hold off on the iridotomies? What would have been the pros and cons of that? Because um, he, he, a cold blue is a cold blue. And I'm just wondering again, um, relative to Ike's point, is it something that you maybe would have waited on? Or do you think it was, he's there, you get it over with, it's definitive treatment. So either Thomas or Ike, um, any comments? Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, I just want to make sure just Thomas, I want to keep on, keep on time. So I'm going to push you along a little bit here. But I think, I think the point is, is well taken here that uh, I think that a PI probably is something people rush into. Certainly in this case, I'm sure that 
uh, that, you know, this probably could have waited, uh, especially when the patient had a code, which is probably a vagal response here. Um, it probably would have been something to consider. On the other hand, it sounds like you did, you know, things went well there. But I think the bigger thing here is that, you know, bilateral angle closure is something that is uncommon to not be related to something systemically. Mm -hmm. And I think this has to be a number one on a differential um, and thinking about his medication, getting through that in, in detailed history. Is he taking something maybe that, that he hasn't told you? Is the patient taking something over the counter? Um, was there some other event that's happening, other medical, hist medical history? Uh, it can be, of course, uh, primary, but uh, often there's something else going on here. That's that's the first point I was mentioned. And just a, a couple of people mentioned about about AC taps. Uh, sure, I think AC tap can work very well to kind of temporize things and just don't let the chamber shallow, but do a small tap, cornea can clear. I think that's a, certainly a reasonable option there. So I'll let you go ahead, Thomas, just to keep you on time here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you. So um, once again, great points were brought up. And I think it's fair to say that all of our spidey senses here are tingling because we have to ask ourselves, how often is an acute attack of primary angle closure bilateral? And there is a little bit of data on that in the 2015 AAO primary angle closure um, preferred practice pattern. They quote the, the metric of 10% as being the incidence of bilateral primary acute angle closure. And they base that on an article in Archives of Ophthalmology in 1997, which was a Singapore uh, island-wide survey study that uh, quoted an incidence of 10% of bilateral acute attacks. Of course, in, likely in our population, uh, being uh, the, the multicultural uh, population that we live in and not being primarily, primarily Asian, um, that's why I put the little less than symbol there. It's likely less than their, their quoted measure. So the point is that it's rather rare, and we ask, have to ask ourselves, as the panelists have mentioned, could there be more here than meets the eye? So, in fact, there is. Um, the very next day, um, another resident on the team reassessed the patient, found him to be stable, and questioned him further about his medications, and actually found that when the patient said Covercil, what he really meant to say was Covercil Plus. And this goes into uh, our needs as, as, as ophthalmologists and, and as residents um, and learners to, to make sure that we're really getting the full picture here from our patient's medical histories. Covercil or perindopril is just an ACE inhibitor, as mentioned. But Covercil Plus, which his primary care physician had just started in on him on a week before, just the day before the symptoms in his right eye began, includes indipamide, which is a thiazide-like diuretic and is, in fact, a sulfonamide derivative. And um, when I was reviewing the case, I was just reminded of the, the response that you can get in the magic eight ball, which is reply hazy, try again later, which is essentially what happened um, in this case. So we modify now moving forward to a differential diagnosis, which many of the panelists have brought up. We can think of this as perhaps being still primary pupillary block angle closure bilaterally and just being a rare presentation. Or if this patient has the well-known um, idiosyncratic response to a sulfa drug, could there be secondary angle closure happening here? Or perhaps um, there could be elements of both. And by the end of the talk, I hope we'll all be able to decide whether we're on team red, team blue, or team purple. And I hope you'll all share your opinions with me at the time. So let's move into it a little bit. We're going to rush through this a bit, as Dr. Ahmed said, to keep on time. The primary angle closure nomenclature from those preferred practice patterns of PACS versus PAC versus PACG. Um, basically, we're looking at the iridotrabecular contact of 180 degrees or more. And if it's PACS, there's no angle pathology, no glaucoma, and normal IOP. PAC, you have high IOP or evidence of angle pathology. And PACG, you're dealing with glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And when we think about primary angle closure, um, once we're in that PAC category, there's basically two approaches or two, um, two branches in your algorithmic differential diagnosis. And it's so important for us to understand what these terms actually mean. Pupillary block, which we use the term so often, of course, means the mid-peripheral iris uh, lens apposition that blocks aqueous, it can cause Bombay. The risk factors are well known to us all in terms of anatomy, demographics, hyperopia, and family history. And the precipitators of acute attack are really many systemic uh, experiences, such as systemic anticholinergics from common uh, cold medications, accommodation, of course, being more of an, of an intraocular process, but it's not just an ophthalmic uh, consideration. Plateau iris, of course, is a, a normal anatomical variant, normal in the sense that there's no, um, there's no pathology happening. It's just that a patient happens to have larger and more anterior ciliary processes. They have the classic double hump on gonio, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. I'll show a picture in a moment. And if there's gonna be an acute attack of angle closure in these patients, the precipitators tend to be similar. And I'll just make a small note here that of course, if there is a patent LPI 
and the angle closure persists, we then call this plateau iris syndrome. And um, uh, I won't ask the, uh, the panel to necessarily comment on this just yet, but maybe just some food for thought. With uh, the Eagle study coming out uh, in 2016 and challenging our um, decades old notions of LPI and its place in our armamentarium, I think um, perhaps we'll have to question whether the term plateau iris syndrome will have to be redefined if LPI starts going away a bit. Um, and, and perhaps even if it will become an antiquated uh, term altogether, if we're just going to simply be moving forward to FACO earlier in our treatment algorithm. But um, perhaps we can discuss that later on. Um, and of course, it's important for us to remember that there can be relative pupillary block as well as plateau iris, and there can be mechanisms of both. Here's just on the top an anterior segment OCT image and on the bottom a UBM image showing on the top iris bombay from pupillary block and on the bottom plateau iris um, from a very large and plump uh, ciliary body and ciliary processes. And here uh, with credit to University of Iowa's excellent, excellent learning uh, website, uh, irounds.org, um, the classic uh, picture on goyoscopy of the double hump, the more peripheral one being the ciliary processes, the processes and the central one being the, uh, the lens. Um, when we talk about secondary angle closure differentials, we should just make note that we're specifically talking about situations without pupillary block because there can be secondary angle closure with pupillary block, such as from an ACIOL without a uh, iridotomy being present or an aphakic patient with the anterior hyaloid moving anteriorly. Um, but if we're going to stick without pupillary block here in the interest of time, we think of anterior pulling and posterior pushing. Anterior pulling generally being from some sort of membranous or adhesion process whether it's PAS, neovascular membranes from ischemic processes like diabetes and CRVO, or neoplastic processes that are either primary ocular malignancies or metastatic. And of course, we have to keep in mind our non-neovascular membranes, such as iridocorneal endothelial syndromes, posterior polymorphous dystrophies, and epithelial downgrowth from surgery or trauma. And when we think about posterior pushing, there are lens-induced mechanisms such as phacomorphic uh, glaucoma specifically, specifically from an intumescent lens, not just because there's a cataract, but because there's actually intumescence and swelling of the AP dimension of the lens, um, ectopia lentis and nanophthalmus in rarer conditions. And the one that we're going to focus on more today, superciliary effusion or ciliary body swelling, secondary to topiramate medications, sulfonamide medications, or tight scleral buckle. And we'll just briefly mention posterior chamber neoplasms and malignant glaucoma in the differential as well. And I just want to highlight here that when we're talking about sulfonamides, and this speaks once again to the point that was made by Dr. Hutnick earlier, we really, really have to remember that the medications that we need to identify are vast, broad, a very, very old classic drug family in, in uh, really systemic medicine that morphs itself into many, many different functions. And many of our patients may be on sulfa drugs and we may not be aware because it may not just be the typical drug that has the word sulfa in its name, such as sulfa methoxazole, the, the famous uh, and very widely prescribed antibiotic, more commonly known as Ceftra or Bactrim. Um, diuretics, acetazolamide and methazolamide, commonly used medications in our practices are, um, are uh, implicated here as well, as well as indipamide in this patient and hydrochlorothiazide, very common in our heart failure patients, and many, many others from broad, broad drug classes. Colococcid, more commonly known as Celebrex, uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, dorzolamide or Azop, our, um, our uh, excuse me, our um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, uh, topical, sumatriptan for, for uh, migraines, and tamsulosin we often think of uh, specifically for floppy iris syndrome, but it once again is a sulfa, is a sulfa derivative. Um, so we need to be sure that these patients, if they come in with an acute attack of angle closure, we're very clear on what their medications are. So we'll talk about uh, sulfa-induced secondary angle closure. The mechanism described commonly is a superciliary effusion or ciliary body swelling and or ciliary body swelling causing zonular relaxation and anterior rotation of the lens iris diaphragm. This of course moves the lens forward and causes an, an acute myopic shift and diffusely shallows the AC and causes acute angle closure bilaterally. Um, and what's fascinating, I'll just mention very briefly, um, when reviewing the literature on this, uh, on this entity, the, the top uh, reference there, the Madalena article uh, from 1968 in Archives of Ophthalmology, that was the first, uh, according to the searches that I was able to find, that was the first report of this um, entity actually causing bilateral acute fulminant angle closure glaucoma. It had been described in previous uh, papers with being what the, the authors called drug-induced myopia. 
but not necessarily acute bilateral angle closure. And this article in 1968 was actually the patient, it, it was a case report, excuse me, and the patient was actually a 31-year-old young woman who had been given just two days before presentation an intravaginal antibiotic sulfa cream um, for a bacteria for a, a vaginal yeast infection. So once again, driving home to us how we really have to be doctors of the entire patient and not just the eyes. Um, the wide, wide range uh, of ages that we can see this condition in speaks to the fact that we need to be aware of all age groups, not just the typical uh, older population that we see with uh, angle closure. Typically, it occurs within the first month, but in particular, uh, over the first two weeks of starting a new sulfa drug or even just increasing a dose. And this ultrasound, as you can see here, um, displays large choroidal effusions. This axial image, in particular, in line with the lens and the optic nerve, shows us the ciliary uh, bodies rotating a bit forward. And this one here, which is off axis, we can see that it really is um, a pan choroidal uh, effusion, not just in line with, um, with the ciliary body. In terms of treatment, Dr. Hutnick mentioned uh, very, very uh, appropriately, of course, that uh, sometimes just stopping the offending drug is sufficient. In that original article by Madalena in 1968, um, just stopping the, um, uh, the drug uh, helped that 31-year-old uh, young woman. Topical atropine and systemic corticosteroids. Myotics, as, as uh, was mentioned with a question from the audience earlier, myotics would be contraindicated here because it would further exacerbate the process by moving the lens iris diaphragm further anteriorly. And we would want to avoid giving diamox or acetazolamide because it's a sulfa drug. And once again, an LPI would not be effective because there's no pupillary block present. Um, we'll just quickly go over the hyperosmotic agents here, um, commonly used. Glycerol is actually an oral uh, juice solution. Um, it gives less diuresis than mannitol, so some people prefer that. However, it's very uh, unpleasant for the patient and there is a risk of hyperglycemia in diabetics. Mannitol, of course, intravenously given. It's a large extracellular molecule that dehydrates the vitreous body as long as the blood retinal barrier and the blood aqueous barrier are intact, They're, thereby allowing the molecule to stay intravascular and drawing the, um, the aqueous component of the vitreous and aqueous humor in the anterior chamber out of the eye. So therefore, if you're dealing with a type of uh, glaucoma, such as uh, uveitic, for example, where those barriers are broken down or compromised, mannitol may actually hurt you rather than help you because the molecule may leak intraocularly and draw, um, draw the uh, liquid component out of the plasma in the blood. Um, as we saw in our patient, large fluid shifts can cause cardiorespiratory distress. There is a risk of actually subarachnoid hemorrhage in older patients who have uh, shrunken brain parenchyma at baseline, and then their brain, uh, their brain parenchyma actually shrinks further from the, di uh, the diuretic effect of mannitol, and the delicate bridging venous um, uh, vessels of uh, the subarachnoid space can actually break, and the patients can hemorrhage. And as Dr. Hudnick mentioned, there can be uncle herniation if we're not careful as well. We must place a Foley because of the diuretic effect, and um, there are reports, of course, of urinary retention occurring in males as well. So not a benign treatment um, at all. Um, just a quick note on topical glycerin, which can be used to simply clear the cornea from edema because of the uh, hyperosmotic nature of it with no effect on IOP. And just one last note here, which I know um, Dr. Ahmed and others were speaking to earlier. Um, there is some uh, question, of course, about perhaps doing an AC tap instead and uh, in the right hands, perhaps in the right setting. This can be very effective, uh, both by reducing the pressure inside the eye and relieving the, uh, the acute attack itself and clearing the cornea for, um, for an LPI by taking off some fluid. However, of course, you're dealing with uh, inflamed, hot eyes with shallow ACs, um, sometimes intumescent lenses, and patients that are nauseous or vomiting and maybe not able to hold still. So uh, an option. Okay, I'm going to just get you to maybe summarize here because we do have to finish up here. Um, is there anything else maybe at the end just to wrap up with the case, if you don't mind? Um, yeah, sure. So I, I was just going to ask the panel and, and the audience to uh, to pick their their poison here, but we can yeah, we just have can... a couple of minutes. Maybe maybe let's go to uh, sure. let's go to the um, to your maybe just where your where your case is now, and then we can maybe get the panel to finish up. My... I have only two quick comments. Um, first of all, very thorough, excellent. Um, in addition to B scan ultrasound, you're going to be accessing the posterior segment in terms of choroidal effusions and choroidal detachments. I also think ultrasound biomicroscopy is important because sometimes you can get a very anterior annular effusion of the ciliary body. So if you're just doing B-scan ultrasound, you could miss that. So ideally, B-scan ultrasound, ultrasound biomicroscopy. And I do think the anterior segment OCT because this gentleman 
in my opinion, probably had a mixed mechanism set up as um, Susan said to be a regular pupillary block, but then had this instigator. The second point is that as, as much as mannitol has some scary things, I think it's the only option if you're not going to do an AC tap because all of the topical eye drops we put on the eye, they, they gave this gentleman systemic side effects, but in an ischemic eye that has pressure induced ischemia, they don't even start working. So the only way, the number one priority for that patient is to get his pressure down. So it's either an AC top, in my opinion, or mannitol. And as we saw, the pilocarpine in this case would have been a, a disservice, which also doesn't work in ischemic eye. Okay, Susan, uh, do you have any any kind of last minute thoughts here? I'm going to have to finish this discussion here, Thomas, because we have to move forward here. But I under, I know that you, maybe Susan can address this question, which the patient's pressures now in the right eye are getting further uncontrolled and patient has tinnitus. So what's your next step here, Susan? So the next step, um, obviously, in this case, would be to remove the lens. And now the question remains is, do we just do a phaco DSL or do we do a phaco Um And that would depend... I would base my decision based on the cup to disc, uh, not the cup to disc, the amount of uh, damage. Does he have a visual field loss or not? Um, and we've seen in some studies that, given it's right now we're within what three months from the acute uh, attack, so sometimes phaco GSL in itself, depending on the oh, there's 360 PAS. And it's phaco GSL itself may be uh, sufficient enough in cases like that to help uh, deepen up, open up the angle and perhaps with surgery itself, uh, break uh, the PAS. Um, and given he, he has normal fields, I wouldn't necessarily jump to complementing the surgery with a TRAB uh, per se at this time. So perhaps go into a TRAB later on, but definitely uh, removal of the lens uh, will help. Good. Well, thank you, Tom. I'm sorry to, sorry to uh, rush you off here. We have to make sure we, we get time for our next presenter too, but thank you for sharing that. Very interesting case of bilateral angle closure. Good discussions about uh, the initial therapy controversy, whether you need to do a PI and rush it or not. And uh, also, of course, uh, thinking about systemic causes of what may be causing this patient here. And you've also covered uh, topics like including the next step. And I agree with you, Susan. I mean, for me, I, I rarely do a phaco trab. It's basically phaco and phaco gonococcalysis, and then wait. If I have to do a trab later, I'll do it later. It's always a bit easier doing it without combining it as well. So, um, and there's some good, you know, data on, on that from different studies. So, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you, Thomas. I'm gonna move over to Guillermo just to make sure we stay on time. Uh, For sure. And, thank you so much, and Su Susan and and Cindy. You're welcome to stick around, of course, and comment on our IOL cornea dilemmas that Guillermo will be presenting. Uh, thank you again, Thomas, for presenting that as well. Uh, Guillermo, uh, you're back again here. Thank you for uh, presenting with us again. Uh, okay. you're, you are going to be speaking about uh, these wonky corneas and lens selection. So I'm looking forward to it. I think you have some interaction as well from the panel and from the polls as well. Exactly. Thank you very much, Ike and uh, Jeb as well for doing this. It has been said many times, but it really has been a great initiative to keep us going through the pandemic. And you can see my slides there, right? We're good? Great. Yeah. You're good. Great. Excellent. So I also would like to thank uh, Samir Melki and Joanna Karemis. Uh, I have known them for quite a few years, and every time I hear them present on something, they always have a, a very interesting approach to things. So uh, I thought this was a, a wonky enough cornea for them to help me uh, through, the, through the journey of this patient. And um, at this point, at the end of the, of the session, uh, I'd like you to hopefully take some, in terms of management of corneal edema with IOL calculation, um, set up also appropriate strategies for lens calculation in abnormal corneas and understand the planning required for general ophthalmologists and general cataract surgeons in, in cases of combined fuchs who need cataract surgery as well. So because the Olympics have been canceled, I wanted to start with this slide. And this actually represents a little bit of what the uh, case will be. Uh, you will see that there will be increasing levels of difficulty as we go through the case. And so we'll start with this. And uh, this is a 57 year old male with an uncorrected vision or pinholes to 2030, but pretty bad uncorrected vision in the right eye. And this is the right eye with the distorted Myers. Central corneal thickness of 802 in the right eye and the left eye 594, and presence of uh, cornea guttata, more so on the right eye. And so um, he, this was in 2018 in March, so corneal edema and also mild cataract. And so the question for, let's say for Joanna, is how would you proceed in this case? 
So, I mean, I think if he already has corneal swelling, I would definitely do a, a combined FACO DMEC. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that would be the standard thing for me. And then I, in terms of uh, biometry, I would, I would try a regular biometry and see if we get any, any numbers. Um, sometimes, you know, if we can't get anything, we'll go with the other side. Uh, and I have also in the past, a, a few, couple of times I've had to like do a superficial keratectomy right before doing a biometry and that's been helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the patient is not interested in like a toric lens, I mean, I wouldn't put in a multifocal, but if the patient wasn't interested in a toric lens, uh, then I, I wouldn't be so, you know, crazy about my biometry. Okay. So I wasn't able to get any K readings in this, uh, in this patient, but, uh, so I'll, I'll go to the next level of, uh, of difficulty and, uh, actually we'll, we'll ask the poll, the audience poll, how would you proceed? Um, would you try to stabilize that cornea a little bit? And Jeb, you can switch over to the poll if you want. I'm not sure if you're, uh, yeah, now I see it. So would you like to use hypertonic solution, uh, anti-glaucoma medications, perhaps do endothelial transplant alone or combined uh, with no IOL or combined with FACO IOL, combined endothelial keratoplasty, DSEC or DMEC with FACO IOL? And so, Joanna, you still stick by your choice of uh, transplant. Samir, yeah. any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, typically, if I see corneal edema, uh, irrespective of cell count and irrespective of, uh, um, of the pachymetry, I go more by what I see at the slit lamp in terms of my decision to do a transplant or, or not. If, even if the cell count is low and, uh, and uh, even if the pachymetry is high, but the cornea is not too edematous or, or there's no edema, I'd rather do the, the cataract surgery alone first and then see how the patient does. Perfect. Okay, so now let's see. We'll increase the level of difficulty. So now our next competitor will do uh, two and a half somersaults while texting, okay? So that's uh, another Olympic reference. Now, does this change your approach? Either Samir or Joanna. This is the right eye. Yeah. And then the left eye, as you can see, the left eye did not have significant corneal edema. So would this change your approach? Well, I mean, all? you'd want to see also if there's more swelling in certain areas that make it look steeper, or is it actual steepness from uh, also keratoconus on top or some ectasia or, you know, I mean, you okay. want to make sure that the edema is diffuse. And um, does the patient have history of any other surgery? Exactly. So this is, you can see a LASIK flap right there. Mm -hmm. And you can see the bullet the right there. And then the posterior stroma. So this is the right eye. So yes, the patient had LASIK with me as well in 2002. I can tell you because I checked that patient myself. It was mild myopia. There was no fuchs, no history of fuchs at the time, no family history of fuchs. And so it was 16 years later that the patient developed corneal edema. And so the question is now, does this change your plan from what you had said before? Um, well, I think uh, if, they're really, if it's really ectasia, if there, if there is some form of ectasia on top of the corneal swelling, then I think uh, I would still do the same thing and maybe cross-link him uh, later or maybe cross-link him before if it's gonna change the biometry. Okay. What about you, Samir? How would you? Yeah, I mean, now I have to think further about uh, about biometry and how I approach this. Um, uh, typically, so, um, you know, if, if, if you didn't have the issue of the ectasia, but you just have LASIK, right, you have to, to typically go with the different formulas and, and, and try to pick. Usually, I would go a little bit more myopic just to make sure I don't have a hyperopic result. But here, you have even more reason to go on a myopic choice because you may be doing a DSEC or a DMAC. You add a layer of complexity by having the irregular astigmatism. And now mm -hmm. you're thinking, okay, do I do a DSEC or a DMAC or do, shall I be going for a transplant? Because I don't know how that irregular astigmatism is gonna affect the vision afterwards. Uh, it looks pretty steep to me. And I don't know how much of that steepness is affected by the edema. Exactly. And so that was, that was actually uh, one of my points right here, this elevation, I thought it was more related to the edema more than uh, on clinical examination, more than the uh, ectasia. So let's, let's stick with the edema. And uh, my question also is for you, both of you are ex uh, good refractive surgeons. 
could fukes have been prevented? Did I do something wrong, really, uh, 16 years ago or 20 years ago when I did this? Uh, I did not see any gute. I have my screen right here with my patient's exam, even as we speak, and uh, there's no documentation of that. So is there any way we can do that, Samir? You know, um, I've had this happen to me a couple of times, and in my LASIK pre-op, I specifically have two spots, one for Gutara and one mm -hmm. for uh, map dog dystrophy. So I, I specifically check for these two things. So I know that I looked. And uh, and then a few years later, the patient comes back and I, and I see three plus good data. I'm like, wow, how, how could I miss that? But then I go back to my original note and, and usually there's nothing. So so no, I don't think you could have predicted that. I mean, sometimes these things just you know, they show up later. Thanks. So yeah, I, that's what I concluded and, and thank you for making me feel better. Although there is a very interesting article out of Mayo Clinic uh, by Sanjay Patel and his group where this is in patients already diagnosed with Fuchs dystrophy with some early guttata. You can actually use the Pentacam as a predictor of what will happen down the line. And the three things that they mentioned should be looked at are irregular isopacs, so that change right here on the isopax, nasal di displacement of the thinnest point, as you see here over time, and then a focal posterior depression as mentioned or as, as demonstrated right here. So there's uh, interesting data now coming from using this, um, but of course this is in patients already with Fuchs. And so what they found was that if you have three variables then there is more chance of progressing, even if you just do cataract surgery alone, than if you have only one or none of these variables. And also what Joanna had mentioned about uh, planning uh, for cataract surgery combined with endothelial keratoplasty, uh, making sure also that you target in a more myopic, uh, myopic way. So I decided, because I wanted to deal with one variable at a time, I said, let's just do a DSEC in this case and see what we get. So that, that's sort of what I did. And his vision was 20 over 400. Uh, the DSEC was fine, but then I developed interface inflammation. So soon after, within a week, he had this picture um, that shows a significant inflammation between the host and the recipient, uh, or be, before the, between the transplant and the, and the host stroma. So what do you guys think, Joanna or Samir? Well, that's on, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I don't think there's a whole lot you can do for that haze other than steroid drops. Um, so I think, uh, you know, and with everything else going on, the question is once it, once the cornea clears, is there, is there also a need for cross-linking? Is there still the story of ectasia or not? Mm -hmm. well, other than mm -hmm. steroids, I don't see what else uh, you could do for that at this point. Okay. How about you, Samir? You know, I agree. I don't think you can do much about it. Um, you know, people think that this can be from viscoelastic. So I don't know if you used any viscoelastic at the time of, of the DSEC or not. Uh, typically you would do that either for stripping or, or if you did a combined procedure. Um, mm -hmm. I prefer to use Helon uh, because it's, it's very uh, cohesive and comes out very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to do actually all my DSECs under Helon, like even the insertion of the, of the mm -hmm. graft, I used to do it under Helon because Helon comes out so easily and it made the procedure much more controlled until we have the injectors and all that, I changed. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I agree with Joanna that if you have it, you have it. I mean, yeah. Now, is he fake Excel there? Yeah, he, uh, he still fake. This is not actually his uh, cord. Okay. I should have clarified that this is from a publication which actually gives it a name. So it's textural interface opacity. And uh, I also have to recognize, I know he's in the, in the, in the call right now, Sadir Hanush, who's one of the authors of one of these papers. Um, and so he's actually the one who, who sort of uh, told me that there was a name for this condition, TIO. And you're, you both are absolutely right. When you have it, you have it. It might be related to, uh, there's different types. There's the punctate type that you see on top. There's also a more elongated type with varying degrees of severity. Mine had more the elongated type with a severe degree. And uh, the way it presents is right here in the interface. Uh, it could be related to the preparation of the tissue. It could be related to the OVD. I actually use very, very little viscoelastic and I always use uh, Helon like you, uh, uh, Samir. Um, may, you may use steroids, but most of these resolve with time. And then it has been shown that after six months, if there's no resolution, you can go back in and do an endothelial keratoplasty and seems to be a good option. So he did get it. And so a lot of conversation, a lot of chair time.
So eventually with some of the steroid, he, he developed less inflammation, but more uh, in, increase in uh, the intraocular pressure. The vision improved somewhat in November. And so the question now is, how would you proceed? So now he's fairly clear in terms of that. So uh, would you at this point then proceed with the cataract surgery or would you proceed with a, with a repeat uh, transplant? Um, well, if, if, I think if the lens is completely clear and he has, and you repeat the topography and there's still some fair steepening, I might, I might do a trial of an RGP to see, you know, is, is there, is it correctable mm. uh, to see if does he need the cataract out is obviously you'd have to check for cystoid macular edema and everything else mm -hmm. and see what would be his best corrected acuity if we could correct for the voltage of the cornea mm -hmm. um, and if there's not a significant cataract and then okay. take it from there. Okay. That's a good point. I actually didn't do a, a contact lens over refraction. And I think that's a great idea. I tried refracting him a number of times, but did not improve much. Um, how about you, Samir? Yeah. Um, one, I wanted to ask you about anterior segment OCT. Uh, I'm assuming that the cornea is now pretty compact. There is no more edema. The pachymetry is good. Uh, you don't see that, that fluid, at the interface of the LASIK flap. Correct. And because of that, I actually get a better topography. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I felt comfortable then proceeding with a facal IOL in the in this case. So that mm -hmm. was sort of my next plan of action. You're absolutely right. The cornea now was behaving like a normal DSEC. Uh, the the lenticule perhaps a little bit thicker. But the question is this now: which IOL power would you choose? Right? Because now we've got a a cornea that has been treated first with LASIK, has now had a transplant. How do we calculate the lens power? Um, and so that will be the next, the next part. So there's a number of variables that we need to consider, including AC depth, case, axial length. But the, need, the, the thing that really is relevant in this case is the fact that we have changed the two surfaces. We've changed the front one, we've changed the back one. And even as a starting point, even when we consider the posterior to anterior rate, ratio, the gull strand ratio, we know that the gull strand ratio says that there's a relationship at 88.31. The real Gallstrand ratio is around 82.31. So right off the bat with current techniques, we're overestimating the corneal power by a bit. And this tends to leave us with a hyperopic result. That's in the best of times. Now in here, uh, when we look at the Gallstrand ratio, so this is where we find it. This is the pentacam and this is where we find it. And the normal is around here. So 82.3, so that's normal. 83 is basically normal. Now, the question comes up in myopic laser and versus hyperopic laser, because in post-myopic laser, we tend to leave patients a little bit more hyperopic if we're not, if we're not uh, careful because of the change in that relationship from posterior to anterior. A similar thing happens with the hyperopic post-LASIK vision correction, but we tend to leave these patients a bit more myopic and these calculations are more forgiving. So we're dealing with a post-myopic laser correction of about minus uh, three. Also, the DSEC creates a bit of a hyperopic shift. So do we need to take that into account or not? So I'll show you a few slides. This is the left eye with a very reasonable, in spite of LASIK, he, he had a very reasonable posterior anterior ratio, okay, 84. Now this is the right eye that we were concerned about before DSEC. You see the steepening right here, and you see the posterior anterior ratio of 112%. And then this is after the DSEC. You can see the DSEC lenticule there, and you can see a flattening probably from the LASIK. And now the posterior anterior ratio is 57.6. So we've really been bouncing around. And although normally we don't take into account whatever happens in DSEC, because we sort of tend to say, well, it's just a hyperopic shift, and that's how we calculate uh, our lenses in combined cases, should we be taking that into account? We have a situation with a decreased posterior radius and an increased anterior radius of curvature. And this is actually a patient's slide. So any comments there before I, I move on into the, the, the three? I'm gonna give you three possible choices unless you have more of that. Samir? Um, I'm still a little concerned about the irregular astigmatism that I see there, although I don't see the inferior steepening anymore. Mm -hmm, I, right here. I, yeah, and, but I see quite a bit of disparity between uh, the superior and the inferior cornea, so it's quite flat. I mean, you're comparing 40 to 33, 
Yeah. So, so I would second Joanna's recommendation on doing a hard lens refraction just to kind of eliminate the cornea uh, yeah. as a source of uh, decreased uh, vision. Um, mm. At least give me an idea of what I'm dealing with. Um, okay. Um, and yes, of course, the, the, the ultimate refractive outcome is important, but you're dealing with two sets of with competing expectations. You have the, the expectation of the corneal transplant patient who has kind of lower expectations with the, with the expectations of your refractive patient who, who expects to see well without yeah. glasses. And yes. uh, so, uh, and, and I guess by talking to the patient, you'll have a better idea, but, uh, but yeah, we can talk further later about the choice of the IOL. Okay. So these are the three choices or the several considerations that I, that I took into account. So this was the other eye. Both eyes were very similar before surgery. And this is what I got with a post laser vision correction formula with the Barrett. And that's around a plus 20. Okay. Now, Second, first consideration is, should I just use the formula that I get? What you see is what you get, a plus 24 on the right eye, um, taking into account that it was a plus 20 in the other eye. So that's the first option. I repeated this with the varied universal as well, confirmed that um, plus 24 seemed like a good choice. Or should I use a formula that uh, gives me the predicted posterior corneal astigmatism. So again, I have this 24 right there. So that's first option for the right eye plus 24. Second option would be the measured posterior capsular, uh, posterior um, corneal astigmatism. So for that, I actually took the measurements from the Pentacam and input them into this calculation. And what I got was around a 27. And my third option then would be just to mimic the other eye because the other eye was very similar. Both of them were very similar before the LASIK. And so the question is, uh, any comments so far here, Joanna? So basically to recap, we have one option is to mimic the left eye plus 20. Another option is go with the plus 24, which I repeated on several occasions. Or the third option is to really measure the posterior corneal astigmatism with the Pentacam, which I did, and I input in this formula, and I got a 27. So I don't think I would go with the 27 because the difference with the other eye really scares me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I would I would look back at the topography and, or the biometry and see if the, if the Ks are really, really different in each eye to explain this difference in the 24 versus 20. Yes. I think I would go more with the 24 because if anything, it'll probably a little bit myopic and seeing as the patient has a regular astigmatism i wonder if the best vision afterwards will be with the hard lens anyways okay. potentially since it might be hard to do like a tcat i don't know if you would do a tcat laser afterwards to fix that irregular astigmatism but i think the patient might need a contact lens anyways after so if we don't fall too myopic maybe we'll be okay and obviously there's always the last resort of iol exchange which with the graft is not okay. ideal uh, so I'll, uh, I'll ask the audience and Jeb, if you want to pop the video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me take care of that. Yeah. And then we'll go back to the. Okay. Just want to make sure this isn't too loud for everybody. So you, you're going to get a choice between the plus 20. Oh, sorry, did you want to. No, something? go ahead. Go ahead. Start it over. We're going to be quarantined, but you have a choice. Do you A, quarantine with your wife and child? Or B. B. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So which eye oil would you choose? Eye oil comparable to the other eye, the left eye, keeping in mind that they were both similar before LASIK. The predicted posterior cor corneal astigmatism plus 24, and that uh, goes in regards with Joanna's comments, or the measured posterior corneal astigmatism plus 27. And any comments from you, uh, Samir? And I agree with, you know, I, I really agree with the contact lens trial. I didn't do that at all, but I agree with those issues and also the issue of the uh, irregular astigmatism that you were mentioning as well. Yeah, it's a tough choice. Uh, I, I would start maybe with a good discussion with the patient, preparing them for uh, <laughs> less than ideal outcome. <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and I did that too. So we'll see the results and go back to my slides, please, Jeb. Oh, yeah. You have to share uh, again. Uh, your, again? Oh, yeah. I, I guess. Okay. Perfect. 
There we go. Excellent. So we'll, uh, we, most people went with the plus 24. Okay. That's, that's actually very reassuring. It's very reassuring because I also went with Jeremy, that. Can I, can I make a comment? I mean, the, sure. the predicted corneal astigmatism is basically based on normal corneas. Correct. Right. So basically yeah. the, the Gaussian ratio and all that stuff is assumed to be normal, but here clearly they're not. No, exactly. And so, I mean, I just, I just, I don't know. I mean, I think taking the anterior cornea alone, which is number one, I think is, is going to be insufficient predicted. I just think it's, it's, it's just too many assumptions in there. And, um, you know, on the pentacam, of course, you know, you can get the total corneal refractive power. Exactly. And there's been some, you know, some, some reasonable studies showing that that can be fairly effective at, uh, at, at determining spherical power and, and also toricity as well. Um, so I'm wondering, about, I'm wondering about looking at, at those aspects instead. Uh, the the patient's, patient was a minus three, you said? Minus three, both eyes before uh, LASIK. Before LASIK, good yeah. Outcome. So, yeah. I mean, I, like, I think like Samir said, I mean, you know, wouldn't mind to leave the patient a little bit myopic anyways. Yeah. Uh, if you ended that way. And, and I presume if they needed to have something further done, it'd probably be easier to treat them if they were myopic than, uh, Correct. than hyperopic. So, so which one would you choose, Ike, of these three? <laughs> I probably would hedge it a little. I would hedge and shift toward the measured. Uh, we've had some reasonable success with Pentacam. This one? So okay. The 27? I would, I would lean toward 27. Maybe I would hedge a bit and maybe drop a diopter off just to kind of okay. kind of kind of hedge my bets a little bit. Okay. So my my process was also sort of in between. I went with a 25. And the reason for that is that I sort of said, well, there's also the DSEC. Let's just add that extra yeah. diopter, taking into account the hyperopic shift. But honestly, this was this was a, a, a toss up. So this was the result. So FACO IOL plus 25, VA 20 over 125, best corrected 2030, and I left him hyperopic. And of course, there's that bit of astigmatism that we had mentioned before. So now what? So lots of conversation with this patient. I was looking at his chart right now before starting. There's visit after visit after visit. So what would you do at this point then, uh, Joanna? I mean, this guy's had a lot of surgery. I, I you know, at some point you gotta stop putting more variables in there with this irregular astigmatism. I think I would mm -hmm. try to convince him to just uh, wear glasses. I, I think the other side is Plano, right? The other side is essentially Plano right now, yeah. I mean, yeah. I would try to convince him to wear glasses or maybe a hard okay. contact lens if he's got even better with that. Okay. And you, Samir? Um, so I would, I would at this stage also do another contact lens, hard lens refraction to see okay. if the 2030 is due to the cornea or something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, Good point. Uh, and um, well, uh, at least we cleared the fact that he doesn't have ectasia. Yeah. So, uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, could exactly. you do more? Sure. If I would, if I, if I was going to do more, uh, I would do PRK. Not, I wouldn't touch the LASIK flap or or anything. Okay. But uh, but I would be reluctant. Um, like Joanna well, said, he's had enough. Hyperopic prescription too. It's going to be. It's not going to be stable. Right. And then uh, you know, yeah. he might come back in a few months with the same prescription. Yeah. Well, and so all of those discussions, the glasses, I was, I was ready to just say, you know, enough of this. Uh, we, we had a really good relationship develop over all of these visits and things. And at some point he said, look, I'm going to Mexico. Let me come back. I'll think about all of this. So anyway, the next step, we discussed all of this contact lens fit, then the YAG. Of course, I didn't want to do a YAG before. Observe, leave them with glasses. I will exchange. We discussed also surface ablation as well. So I ended up doing an IOL exchange, okay? And so here the, the point is again, which power would you use? And uh, so we need to be familiar with the Virgin's formula and there's different options. I know there's one in the Packers uh, website, uh, Warren Hill is the one that I used. And also the Panacea formula as well uh, can help us sort of pinpoint what type of power uh, we need to do. So remember we had started with a 25 and these formulas are telling me to increase it by 2.8. This one is saying now you should use a 27.5. So I exchanged it for a 27.5 diopter lens, which was interestingly the closest to using the Barrett with the laser vision correction module and the measured posterior corneal astigmatism from the Pentacam, go figure. 
I'm just curious, That's, Guillermo, if you're going to do an eye well change, why not, why not do a torque? It sounds like with it, it does correct, despite his cornea. Yeah. He does get a benefit. I presume he gets a benefit from correcting that one and a quarter diopter of cylinder. And you have the refractive axis. I'm wondering yeah. whether you think about that, you know. I, I did think about it. I, I put it right. Well, I put it in the previous slide. I, I, I wasn't convinced where the axis was. I really wasn't that convinced. Um, and so his end result was... I guess I guess, I guess the point is though I mean if you if you have a consistent refractive axis see here yes. here I wouldn't be look I wouldn't be looking at the keratometry at all for this for That's the axis true. I'd be looking at what axis do I put that cylinder on, on his glasses and yeah. it was like oh 120 is like beautiful I, I see much better and I get versus uh, versus not correcting it then I think yeah. you have your answer yeah. yeah well only if he's happy with the glasses because if yes. regular astigmatism exactly. correct happy. that'd be really critical and exactly. see, here's a, here's a, here's an exchange with without correcting it, and here's with it, you're still not going to be perfect, but whether that exactly. helps or not, but you're absolutely right, because he's not going to be completely, you know, 2020. And exactly. So I exchanged the lens. I did a yak capsulotomy a month later, and then the final result was uncorrected 2040. This is his okay. refraction, 2030 vision. He's happy. We're happy. We're still good friends. And, uh, and I think, uh, I, I thought there was a interesting case before, before the next slide, uh, Samir or Joanna, any, any comments on this? Well, um, it's, a good, it's a good result. I mean, I would have, I would have shied away from an IOL exchange only because, uh, because of the graft and, you know, the, the loss of cells with another, you know, you have the fake one now, another surgery. I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. you're very careful and you put a lot of viscoelastic, but I mean, I, I tend to shy away from that if I can, if the patient's okay with, uh, with wearing glasses. I guess it depends on your patient and how. Yeah. You know. and so um, here. There are two good suggestions from the audience, actually. One of them is asking about whether Aura would be helpful in this situation. Mm -hmm. And the second mm -hmm. is whether a sulcoflex lens, the Rainer yeah. sulcoflex. We don't have access to that in the US. I don't know if you have it in Canada. We do. It mm -hmm. always fascinated me that you know this lens exists <laughs> because I wish we had it. So I'm not sure what your experience is. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of Aura. I don't think that it works as well as everyone thinks it does. But uh, again, I don't use it that often, so I prefer not to give too strong of an opinion about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are those are a couple of good options as well. I um, haven't. I know the Sulcaflex is still uh, under special access, right, Joanna? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Why I, I yeah and yeah. that too would also, you know maybe have its own issues maybe with iris shaping and you yeah. know, things closer to the desac i don't know so yeah. i found i found the sulcal flex lens does does still rotate so to correct astigmatism with sulcal flex lens i i don't find it to be as reliable so i don't use it for that but as a piggyback lens i mean that is, i guess that would have been an option too guillermo if you want to piggyback exactly put a, put a plus three in yeah do that too but i think you know I, it's nice to just have the hardware in the bag if you can like you did yeah if you can go in anyways and um and do that so surgery. yeah exactly interesting the and comment I, I, about, about aura at the first time at the initial yeah. surgery when you did the cataract and considering would you do aura because i know uh, you know in post lasik eyes there yeah. perhaps is some is some benefit i don't I like samir i don't really you know use aura uh, i've used it a few times i i'm not sure whether it really helps us in terms of routine cases but for post lasik cases you know maybe there is some benefit maybe not i don't know clearly yet but yeah. it would have been nice to get a confirmation i guess if you had it i guess it'd be nice to have it but yeah yeah, there's one main reason why I didn't do it, which is because I don't have it. <laughs> so, but I think it's a great idea. This would be an ideal case for that. I totally agree. So this was a learning case for me. I mean, what did, what did, what did I learn? I mean, you obviously, we always do very good exams in, uh, in all our pre-op patients, but um, anticipate, and Samir had mentioned, uh, he's got a couple of cases like that. And there can be things that happen long-term. And in particular, in this case, ended up developing fuchs. Um, I also learned about the management. I had had one other patient with um, textural interface opacity, but this one obviously was more stressful in a way because I had to have a lot of conversation and we were already gearing up in a more challenging case. Uh, IOL planning has its things. And uh, so you have to spend a lot of time talking to these patients. And um, you know, Ike, you and I organize with uh, our team and with a lot of uh, faculty this course uh, every year. And I still tell patients, you know, even though I, I give uh, sessions on this, I can still be wrong. And definitely I was wrong in this case, but having the importance of, of discussing with the patient is very important. Knowing what to do as options, laser, contact lenses, glasses. In this case, I use the Virgin's formula. 
And um, I think you just got to play the game, take calculated risks, be patient and communicate honestly and openly with your patient. And I think it was, uh, in the end, a good result that, uh, that created a lot of uh, a, a great physician patient relationship with a happy outcome. I know his other eye is, is, is sort of starting to develop changes from Fuchs, so we'll tackle that one um, and uh, we'll see what happens. But thank you, Samira and Joanna. I don't know if you have any uh, last, uh, any other comments. Maybe Sorry, a very interesting case. I, don't send them to me when you do his other eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great case. Thank you, Guillermo. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, uh, I think that was a great discussion, as I said. What was, what was good is that you both had different perspectives. I, I hadn't considered some of those options. So thank you very much for your suggestions as well. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, really good discussion, uh, everybody, on that case. Um, and I think, Guillermo, like you said, I mean, you know, we need to understand where our predicted uh, posterior corneal astigmatism uh, mm -hmm. is generated from and how it is. And I think uh, healthy respect and understanding of, of basic optics and the gall strand ratio and everything else are, are really important. So you've highlighted mm -hmm. it well. I know it's a lot of optics that can get a little bit uh, difficult at times, but I think these are the cases where really we've got to pull out that textbook and understand it better. So I thought you did great, mm -hmm. Guillermo. I know there are a couple people on, ch on the chat line that were like commenting on you could have got 2020 perhaps, but uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe a with bit time, higher. with time, it was a DSEC. So I know DSEC will clear <laughs> up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's no, that's fantastic. A lot of great learning pearls uh, here as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, right. I want to thank you again, both presenters, Thomas and, and, and Guillermo. Thank you so much. I'm getting uh, Zoom bombed again here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Cindy and Susan, for, for your comments you. for the first case as well. Uh, Samir, it's really great to see you here and keep well and safe in Boston as well. Uh, Joanna as well. I hope you are keeping well and We'll be back in the OR soon enough. I hope we're all getting a little edgy, I know, and uh, I hope that we'll, uh, we'll be able to get past this, uh, at least to a, a, new, a new normal, whatever that may be. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for organizing this. I want to wish everybody online, uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we do have now uh, CME credits, so you can get them, uh, and Jeff will be sending them out if you're on Zoom. If you're in the U.S., these are equivalent to uh, also AMA credits as well. So the equivalent Royal College credits are, are transferable to AMA credits as well. I know that was something that many people have asked. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank again, uh, we'll see you on Saturday. Uh, for those of you that are going to attend PRISM rounds, otherwise we'll see you tomorrow for a few other events coming up. And God bless everybody. Yeah. Stay safe. Love everybody. Have a good day. Thank Take you. care. Say bye. Bye, so bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.